Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, we're delighted to be here. This is a, a really great conference. Uh, we are, uh, uh, we have on, on this panel some very exciting guests. Uh, we have uh, Maureen Carlson, who is with Baker Hughes. We have uh, Sharon Novak, who is with Shukin and Benu. We're very excited. We also have um, Moshelle Bitton at Adionics, and we have uh, Andrew Coleman at EPRI. And uh, we are, uh, as, as, uh, Sharon, as Sharon said, I am the head of the uh, renewable energy and infrastructure law firm practice for Pillsbury Law. We represent many uh, Israeli companies coming here to the US. We have a dedicated uh, practice that just represents uh, Israeli companies uh, uh, with uh, my colleague that's read, uh, led by Ari uh, Bourbon. So I want to talk about on this panel, we have, we have uh, the top people in the field. They're going to talk about uh, disruptive technologies on our panel. We have, uh, I'm, I am super excited. We're going to talk about uh, very quickly the, uh, some new developments in EVs, in storage, in infrastructure, uh, and hydrogen. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I will be asking some questions of my guests. And for those of you that have questions, please put them in the chat box and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get to them either during this panel or, or afterwards. But we're really uh, uh, very excited. It'd be very interesting to hear uh, what they have to say. So um, first, I want to talk with uh, Maureen Carlson at Baker Hughes. Maybe you can, uh, uh, if there's anything, if you could introduce yourself briefly. And what I'd like for you to kind of comment on is how is Baker Hughes using technology to advance the energy transition globally? Maureen, there you are. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me OK? Think louder, a little louder. Okay, okay, great. Okay. So hi everyone, Maureen Carlson from Baker Hughes. I'm very excited to be here uh, to meet to meet with you and talk with you today. Uh, before I, I get into a little bit, just wanted to just give a little bit of perspective as I was thinking about, you know, the importance of a conference like this. Um, I, I live in Houston and we did uh, lose power for several days a couple weeks ago. And, um, you know, very unexpectedly, right? Uh, power and water all of a sudden wasn't available. And, you know, it very much relates to how we can, you know, figure out what, what do we need to do here from, you know, balancing the, the grid. And, you know, as we were getting through our days and trying to figure out, you know, how to log in and, and, and how to, you know, get heat, um, we did discover a new way to make breakfast as a family. And, you know, it was simple, but it reminded me that, you know what, when we're in these, you know, situations, we're very creative. Um, and so that's one, you know, real um, benefit. And I think especially to um, a panel, you know, a session like this is that we can all work together to be creative in this space because there is a major need. We need to reduce emissions. We need to help, you know, help the planet going forward. So just a little personal reflection uh, before I get going here. Um, so back onto your question. So um, B Baker Hughes and, and how do we, you know, are using technology to advance energy transition. Um, so, you know, we've been in the hydrogen industry for over 60 years, um, providing products to hydrogen, to the hydrogen space. And that's, you know, one example where we have a lot of experience especially let's say in the materials uh, around, you know, hydrogen and bricklement and things like that. And, and we've been incorporating that into our compression. So we're working to advance our compression to make it ultimately lower, lower cost low, uh, to produce hydrogen. Uh, so that's one, one example. Um, also, also in hydrogen, um, we focus on the combustion. Uh, so we use, we have a lot of gas turbines in our fleet 
And um, we do have a, a gas turbine running on 100% hydrogen. And we're, we're basically you know, using what we've learned there to see, well, how can we roll this out in, in, in the need for potentially burning hydrogen in gas turbines, but also even just blending it, let's say, in a pipeline situation. So um, I think it's important to think about, you know, how do we get from, you know, here where we stand to where we want to go, it is going to be a journey. Um, if, I, if I take another step back and think about energy storage, so we are, uh, we're in the, the um, when we think about energy storage, we think about where can we put machinery and how can we help there. So that's in the thermomechanical piece of energy storage. And you'll hear later about some, some um, you know, different types of energy storage, but what Baker Hughes focuses on is, uh, is, is thermomechanical storage. And that's really long-term storage uh, where you're gonna use maybe let's say compressed air energy storage and you would have, let's say, a duration of 10 hours or more um, where you can really start to, to level out the grid a um, few years out, but it uses, it uses machinery that we are very familiar with. Um, so again, it's, it's trying to find where do we have existing products that we can just tweak a little bit to really uh, apply to the energy transition. Thanks, Maureen. Uh that was very, very enlightening. Very, very uh, nice to hear about what uh, Baker Hughes is doing. It's such an established company here in the US. Um, I'm gonna pivot now to an amazing uh, startup, uh, Israeli startup that is really game changer. I'm very excited to um, uh, welcome uh, uh, um, Adionics with their CEO, uh, um, uh, Moshe uh, Bitan, if uh, who is uh, they're they're talking about 3D EV batteries, and uh, they are a they are using physics. Uh, and uh, Moshe, if you could, I don't know if I could see you. I'm not sure where you are. Oh, there. Okay. <laughs> this is. <laughs> could you? Could you please tell us a little bit about uh, Adionics, your company, how this is game changing? Uh, the uh, that would be great. If, and the applications of the of this uh, of the batteries. Sure. Thanks, Mona, and uh, thanks everyone. So my name is Michelle, I'm the CEO of Adionics, and uh, we are changing the structure, the architecture of batteries and not the chemistry as most of the other companies do. Uh, in the recent years, we see like a great uh, I would say investment and research in the, the chemistry domain. And uh, there is still a, a slow pace and we need to uh, squeeze more and to improve more batteries in order to make our world uh, a, a better planet uh, and uh, decarbonize and as, as everyone other said. Uh, in order to do that, we need to um, fundamentally uh, improve some issues as uh, to create power and uh, energy batteries at the same time. Usually there is a trade-off. And this is mainly tied with the uh, chemistry and the uh, conventional structure of the battery. So we change the architecture of the battery, the physics, and not on the chemistry. And by doing that, this is uh, allow us to unlock the potential uh, with uh, improved uh, batteries. Uh, in terms of application, uh, the, the fact that we are chemistry agnostic uh, make us very uh, unique to different type of chemistry. So we have projects with uh, different type of chemistry and also different type of uh, industry from consumer electronic to uh, EVs. Uh, so we're not limited. And we would like to see our solution in every chemistry and every uh, uh, sector. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Ochil. That's very uh, interesting. We, I can't wait to hear more. Um, next, I wanna move to uh, Sharon Novak, who is the uh, CEO of Shukin and Banu USA. And uh, they are here in the US doing projects in both energy and infrastructure with P3s. 
And uh, Sharon, we're delighted to have you. We'd like to ask you a question about ways to advance new technologies in the private sector, in particular with uh, the uh, infrastructure in the infrastructure world, uh, how you are using the, these new technologies to support uh, development and, and implementation. Uh, thank you, Mona. Uh, first, uh, to congratulate you on your uh, improved uh, accent pronouncing uh, the different names, which <laughs> I, I, I saw an uh, improvement over the last year. <laughs> Um, but uh, I'll, uh, back to the point. So uh, first, nice to meet you all. Sharon Novak, uh, CEO of uh, Shikuni Binu USA. Uh, we are a subsidiary of uh, Israeli-based uh, public company uh, Shikuni Binu. Uh, we are very active uh, in Israel in uh, the energy market, as uh, Guido mentioned before, uh, following uh, closely uh, a lot of the projects uh, that the Ministry of Energy uh, advances and are involved in uh, all, all aspects of, uh, of the energy market in Israel. Uh, we started our energy operations in the US uh, last year. Uh, here we focus uh, on renewable uh, energy, uh, solar, uh, wind, and uh, focus on uh, storage uh, of different, uh, different kinds. Uh, I think it's uh, important to mention, the Mona, like you said, we are involved in the infrastructure world, um, which is uh, the way we see it, uh, very integrated with the energy world. Uh, also, I see here a lot of the people that we are working on, uh, on infrastructure projects are also uh, here in this uh, uh, forum and they are involved in the energy market, uh, which maybe emphasize uh, the connection and the importance of the relationship between uh, the different, uh, uh, different markets. Um, to, uh, to your question, um, I think that it's very important, uh, and we saw it in the last uh, decade or so, uh, with the changing technologies uh, to keep following up and make sure that uh, uh, new technologies are implemented uh, in existing projects and in uh, uh, an infrastructure is prepared for future projects. Um, I would say that even in the last uh, few years, uh, we saw a few different uh, uh, technologies being introduced, especially when it comes to the uh, storage uh, market. I see also in the chat a lot of questions about uh, that. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, in Israel at least, uh, or in, in other places in the world, uh, CSP technology was perceived as the uh, breakthrough technology and the future technology for storage. Uh, today, we have a totally different direction, whether it's battery uh, or hydrogen uh, uh, storage capabilities of sorts. Uh, on that respect, it is very uh, important and significant uh, to cooperate with uh, the public uh, uh, sector in order to, to be implement, uh, to be able to implement new technologies that have not been tested yet. Uh, it was true back then for the uh, for the CSP projects, which at the end of the day uh, maybe didn't uh, materialize into a sustainable uh, long-term uh, technology, but the need. Uh, to test it, uh, or the ability to test it was uh, possible because of uh, public uh, public support. Uh, and the way uh, we see it also moving forward uh, to our uh, future projects, um, new technology must be, uh, uh, must be implemented with the continued uh, changes uh, that we see, uh, that we see in the market. One of the, one of the reasons uh, of our activity in the US is actually the ability to uh, be on the uh, forefront of, uh, of this, uh, these new technologies with, I guess, an emphasis on uh, storage uh, technologies as well as uh, distributed generation, uh, which uh, I think that in these areas, uh, the US is uh, definitely leading, uh, leading the way uh, uh, for technologies that will later be implemented in other places as well. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much. That's uh, the, um, very enlightening. It's good to hear uh, what's happening. Um, I'm going to move next to Andrew Coleman, who is with EPRI. Uh, Andrew, you know that uh, investors and companies are making bold decisions on technologies. And uh, that's always the case with research and development in the energy transition that we're seeing. 
Uh, some of these investments, it's really hard to decide what to invest in and what not to, what's a waste, what's not. Uh, can you tell us how, what your organization's role is in helping those uh, investors uh, make those decisions on where to uh, provide guidance in? Uh, Andrew, I think you're on mute. Can... Andrew, hold on. I think you're still on mute. Uh, if and you go... Andrew, can you unmute yourself, please? Okay, now it'll end. Now it works. Thank you. Oh my gosh. So, good morning, everybody. I think uh, I had a little bit of feedback there for a second. That was a problem. Hi, my name is Andrew Coleman. I am from Electric Power Research Institute. I'm the senior manager there for our government area, which is we, I manage all of our, actually, all of our government grants. So, it's a great place for me to give some insight on uh, what we do and uh, how we connect to all this, this R&D. So um, just before I get started, I'll just tell you a little bit about EPRI. We're a 501c3 nonprofit research and development company, and uh, we work all around the United States and internationally. We focus on mainly electric power generation, but energy in general, its delivery, its collaboration with the energy sector, the utilities, stakeholders, and uh, you know, really our mission is to make power safe, reliable, affordable, and environmentally responsible. So um, where EPRI really stands up and does its job is uh, a very unique place in the R&D world where we identify the technology gaps, we identify issues, broader needs that can be used um, and addressed through uh, research efforts and development programs. And all of the R&D that we actually do through our work benefits society. So. Mona, that's, um, Mona and everybody, that's, that's kind of where we sit, you know, in the R&D world where we, you know, impact where you're talking about now is um, we work with companies all around the globe, startups, um, regular established companies to really effectively look at the technology or any incremental technology improvements. And we, uh, we look at that in an unbiased a uh, partial way to see how it impacts the grid stakeholders, the rate payers, and make our grid more resilient. So I hope that helps you a little bit. I mean, you know, interestingly enough, we're talking about this whole Texas issue, and I'll tell you one thing that we did and real quick and how we impact and make our, our work very impactful is it's um, interesting that, you know, we just put out a, a big paper two weeks before, um, the entire thing happened, the entire weathering issue happened in Texas about what happens in a one in 10 year, one in 10 year event and whether they occur in one in 10 years. And just so happens we were talking about the resiliency of Texas grid in that paper. If you need to look at that paper, go right to EPRI's website and you can see on www.epri.com a whole bunch of different papers, but this one was just published in Power Magazine. So Thanks for this opportunity. I'll give it back to you, Mona. If anybody has any questions, just send me your email and I'll get back to you. Thank you, Andrew. That was very helpful uh, to, to, to know about uh, your organization and what you do to uh, guide others, especially with the R&D. Um, I'm gonna move next to Maureen. Maureen, uh, Baker Hughes. It's known as an oil and gas company and for a traditional oil and gas company, how are you now, I know that like other big oil majors, uh, you're pivoting to renewables. How are you helping right now uh, your customers in this new pivot with respect to decarbonization? Great, thanks Mona, that's, that's a great question. And I think, you know, I think the oil and gas industry in general is thinking, okay, well, there's still gonna be a need for, for oil 
for fossil fuels for a while, but, but how do we make it the most environmentally friendly? Um, and, and so the first thing that, that we did was we looked internally and said, okay, we, got, we have to make sure we can figure this out on our own first. So what is our own strategy? Um, and you know, we're really focusing on number one, it's the low hanging fruit. So how do we operate more efficiently? Um, how do we you know, notice where there's ever any you know, venting and things like that? Because in, in venting in oil and gas, it could be methane and that's even more um, you know, harmful than, than just CO2. So really focusing in on um, you know, what can you do first, right? And then think about, okay, after you get through all of the efficiency and really reduce um, you know, what you might, what your carbon footprint, then it becomes later on down the road offsets and things like that. So, so first we kind of have our, you know, the philosophy internally. And now what we've been doing is going out with our customers and looking at, okay, how can our products help with improving efficiency? How can we, you know, we have a methane detector systems that can fly around and find leaks how do we, you know, we have valves that, that are, you know, zero, zero leakage valves. How do we incorporate that into, um, you know, the, the offerings that we give to the customers it, as well as think about, you know, what are the regulations and how can you, can you marry the two? Because, you know, there's one, if you, if you go completely to net zero, you won't be operating as a company right away, right? So you have to kind of walk in steps. And so we're really trying to guide our customers with, okay, step one, do the things that you can do that really are not that expensive, but also actually save you money, like reducing venting um, and, and improving efficiency. And then step two might be, um, you know, maybe trying to do a little bit of hydrogen blending. So you reduce your emissions that way, or maybe a combined heat and power where you can use, um, you know, just your, the power that you use more efficiently. Um, and then I think the other piece is as you get to the, you know, kind of step three, which might be, you know, electrification or, um, or carbon capture, what are the things that we need to do now to get there in a few years? And, and that's really where the pilot projects become really important, right? So finding the right partners and, and getting that technology out and, and, and in the field. Thank you, Maureen. That's very interesting. I'm going to move now to uh, Moshiel. You guys are developing um, new technologies that are, you know, that is going to transform the way that we store and deliver energy in the, uh, with your batteries and while still having a very positive effect on the environment. Can you tell us a little more on what we need to do from here in, for batteries in terms of the price of energy, charging time, and how do we go there and the challenges that you see? Sure. So I think first also for the previous question, I would say that uh, given the, the high demand in the market and the uh, the slow pace of improvement, uh, even a small change in the key parameters, a huge economic value. The world is uh, desperate for, for improved performance. So in terms of, um, I would say the, the key performance that uh, needed to, to be improved. So the first one is, is price. Price also always is the, the major uh, and the key uh, role for uh, the transmission into uh, electrification. But what we saw in the last, uh, I would say, few decades, uh, advances in battery that actually made many modern advances possible, um, but are, they are still not enough to make the world like a, a better planet and uh, to full adoption of electric vehicles. And all those uh, aggressive targets of electrification cannot be uh, met with uh, today's batteries. So uh, yes, we need to have both a uh, fast charging and long range battery. And it's fundamentally difficult to make, to make batteries, which will be with high energy and uh, also with fast charging and at the same time cheap. And uh, to make that, uh, we need to uh, go to some different ways to utilize the advantage in chemistry and unlock uh, the potential with uh, changing the architecture. 
And uh, I think the, the key element uh, also of challenges is the uh, huge investment that is needed to, to, to be done in order to, to make this transition. And uh, the way to uh, utilize that and to overcome this challenge is to have a, a drop-in solution. That uh, not, there is no need to, to change any equipment in today's batch manufacturing factories. So to have a minimum change, but uh, maximum impact. Thank you. I, I, uh, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm, uh, Moshiel, I'm going to stay with you for a minute. What, sure. how do you see the EV market changing? Because this is the market you're dealing with. How do you see it changing fo going forward? So I think we, in the next decade, we'll see more and more uh, EVs. And the adoption will happen faster than we, we think. And uh, this yeah. will be driven directly from the reduction in the battery price. I think uh, there are also lessons that we can learn from other industries. Like for instance, if you take uh, software, so they make huge progress by just reusing code others have built and building mm -hmm. uh, another layer on top of it. And uh, so taking existing chemistries and uh, the huge production facility that already built for them and putting another layer of technology uh, on top of them. So taking to them to next generation creates a, a huge advantage. Um, from the semiconductor industry, unfortunately, we don't have a more low in batteries, but what we can learn and what is, uh, can be applied to the battery uh, industry is all the focus on smart automated manufacturing processes. And this is another uh, key element to reduce the, the price and going to lead to more uh, electrification and adoption of electric vehicles. Thank you, that was excellent. I'm gonna move next to Sharon. Sharon, tell us uh, how, what you are doing, what is Shukin and Benu doing for uh, their you know, market leaders in innovation? in the uh, public process in the P3 space. Can you elaborate on uh, what, what uh, your company is doing in that regard? Yeah, yeah thanks, Mona. <laughs> um, um, so, so first, I think one of the challenging, challenges that we are dealing with and that uh, Andrew, uh, companies like yours, uh, uh, support of obviously the, the decision is that we see um, a few trends that are making the process uh, uh, very challenging. Uh, on one end, uh, very quick and rapid changes in technology and understanding um, of in, in, in any different, uh, in many different sectors, if it's a EV, if it's storage, or if it's uh, something else. On the other end, because of uh, the products, the actual products are getting uh, better and better. So we're looking on a more long-term view uh, in terms of uh, uh, the time, time life uh, of, uh, of the product. Uh, it's, I guess, most, uh, um, we saw it very uh, significantly on the PV market uh, in the last uh, few years. Uh, and the third component uh, is the rapid uh, environmental changes. Uh, so every, uh, um, you know, a 10 year uh, event uh, now happens every other year and extreme events, a uh, hundred or 500 years event happens much more often. So taking all of these uh, uh, things into account uh, and being able to uh, focus on a specific technology uh, in order to basically uh, count on it for the next uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years, that's one of the main challenges uh, that we are dealing with as a, um, as a company. Uh, I think the same challenges come from, uh, from the other side as well. Uh, so from the public sector, it's also challenging to uh, have a long-term um, strategy or the strategy, the uh, long-term plans uh, of how to uh, basically what should be implemented in the short term in order to support uh, the long-term goals. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the, one of the main challenges. Um, and... Uh, Unfortunately, it doesn't make it uh, easier for uh, for any of us. Uh, but on the other end, it, it does open a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities uh, for um, a lot of changes, basically, and a lot of things are progressed 
uh, every day and companies like uh, uh, Mojiel's company and other companies basically are trying to improve uh, uh, some sort of an existing technology uh, that can be implemented that are playing, as, I think, it's a very significant role in, the, in this process. Now, Sharon, can I just say, ask as a follow-up question uh, because you, you touched about it. Uh, can you tell us, just so we can dive in a little bit, just more specifics like on this, this tech lab that, that uh, Shukun and Benu has and how you're accelerating using that? Yes, yeah, so one of the things that, uh, that uh, Shikun El Bino is involved in uh, together with, uh, with NL uh, is a technology lab that support uh, uh, early stage uh, uh, companies. Uh, it's an initiative of, uh, uh, of the ministry, well, it's under the Ministry of, uh, uh, of Energy. It's uh, the, the, innovation, uh, the Innovation Authority in Israel. Um, so a technology lab uh, that basically we uh, support uh, new uh, new companies in uh, different uh, different areas that relate to um, to the work that uh, we are uh, we are performing. Uh, so the focus is mainly on the three N or on two or three areas: uh, construction, uh, infrastructure, and real estate, and uh, and energy. We're looking on the, on different kind of uh, uh, of technologies. Uh, one of the main focus is the AI and how it's implemented both uh, in the construction uh, sector. Uh, if we're talking about uh, design processes, monitoring, and the uh, optimal utilization of uh, equipment, uh, we're seeing it on the financing uh, sector of uh, better uh, lending tools and more uh, up to date uh, um, uh, tools to, to support. Uh, um, new requirements, whether it's uh, to help with uh, more of a distributed uh, generation uh, and distribu distributed uh, um, off takers, uh, and whether it's, uh, uh, it's uh, something else. And a lot in the energy sector, both in the energy sector and the construction side, uh, with uh, the measuring and the uh, serving of, uh, of areas, as well as uh, the optimization of, uh, of production. Uh, in different energy technologies. Uh, I think uh, the biggest changes we see now is uh, the optimization of uh, uh, standalone battery technologies, actually. That's great. I love how we're, you know, it, it, you know at uh, Shukun and Benu, we're combining all the new energy technologies with P3 implementation so, uh, as well. So I think that's really cool. Andrew, let me move to you. Can you unmute? Yes. Uh, Andrew is an expert. You guys are an expert on uh, the energy storage. And I think that that really is also another game changer that, that we've been seeing. Can you tell us uh, why you think energy storage is projected to grow so quickly? And what are the drivers uh, here? To our to our audience. Sure. So thank you. Uh, thanks for that, that question. So we, uh, you know, as you can probably see, like in the uh, the the blackouts that have happened in Texas, people um, were probably hoping in some places to have energy storage. It's a uh, obviously going to fill in the blanks in the future for all these resiliency needs, but. Some of the key drivers for energy storage have been um, really, you know, originally part of the DER structure with regard to the utility needs, in particular renewable generation. So, um, you know, early on when we studied the duck curve, we obviously looked at the wind outputs and the solar PV outputs and saw when there was demand side uh, generation needed, and these batteries help, you know, smooth out the the differences in demand. And then, you know, another big driver that we've seen is the technological advancements that we just talked about with our previous speakers alluded to that regarding the decreases in costs. You know, over, I'd say since like 2010, we've seen about like an 80% reduction in costs of lithium ion batteries. And the forecast is that you know, by 2025, we should be seeing the prices go to about like $96 a kilowatt hour. And even out to 2030, we can model 
uh, price is probably dropping somewhere around $70 a kilowatt hour. And then, um, you know, the whole thing about customer choice is also driving a huge amount of demand, um, not only just utility customer choice, but the engagement and how you want to use your energy storage when you want to use the time of use based on your rate plan. And then I'd say lastly is to the drive for it is, is policy and, and regulation shifts. And we, we've seen some of that, you know, come at us with, um, you know, looking at regulations pivoted towards like grid infrastructure and the sizing for peak needs. And then just around the entire infrastructure discussion, we're talking about grid modernization and then the aging utility infrastructure. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a window to your, your question. Great, thank you, Andrew. Sure. I'm gonna, uh, do we, <laughs> Sharon, do we have one more question? Is it, do we have time for one more question or no? I think that uh, we have time to go around for, um, you know, last remarks from all the participants, maybe last question, but that's about okay. it. Thank you. Okay, so this, this is the last question for all of you. Uh, and we'll do it in the same order is if, uh, and just quickly, because we don't have that time, we don't have much time, unfortunately, if there is one single piece of advice, because we have many executives on this, uh, uh, you know, that are in our audience today, in terms of the energy transition, what would you give them? What, what piece of advice would you give them? Maureen, let me start with you first. Okay, so my, my advice would be, let's get real. Uh, let's, <laughs> so, so, and what I mean by that is, we don't necessarily know what this future is going to hold, but let's start trying stuff, right? So I think there's been a lot of, there's a lot of great senior level conversation. Oh, what are you guys interested in? What are you guys interested in? I don't know. What are you guys interested in? And let's, let's pick some pilots and let's move forward. So that, that's my piece of advice. Great. Moshiel, I'm moving to you. What is, you, you are the executive, but what, what piece of advice? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the, the best thing is not to bet on a specific solution. We don't know who is going to win. So we need to bet on the energy race, but not on a specific course. At the end, it will be a few solutions that are going to uh, win this path. And I think uh, solutions that can be applied in different industries in different like technology environments going to be uh, the ones that are going to to lead this uh, transformation great thank you Sharon. i would say that uh, also the ceo giving more ceo advice <laughs> i would say that uh, uh, supporting and trying new technology like maureen said is important but uh, for at least a, a not, not as a startup it's important to find out uh, and to see what uh, the underlying uh, constraints are whether it's infrastructure or land, uh, like it was mentioned before, uh, and, uh, and invest in that in the long term. So implement, implementing uh, future technologies will be possible. Thank you, Sharon. And Andrew, who counsels all the executives, tell us what your piece of advice would be. Well, you know, we all know that energy storage has all these applications in entire, uh, over the entire electricity value chain. So I would say, you know, really succinctly to get us on moving on is that we want to know really where your energy storage application really works really well, whether it's like large scale renewables or substations or microgrids or commercial and residential. Oftentimes, you know, uh, technology companies come in with a gigantic solution, but it really depends on where that solution is applicable. So um, I'd say hone down your technology to specific uses where it really has massive impact and scalability. Thanks, Mona. Thank you, Andrew. So I wanna thank uh, my whole, all the panelists here. Thank you so much for your time. This was great, I had fun. I will just say in parting that as the deal lawyer, it's important to make sure the technology works and it's bankable and that you can scale it. And you want to also make sure that it can proliferate and, uh, and do well. So you can rinse and repeat. So I take it back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mona, uh, for hosting this uh, panel discussion. Um, 